don't switch to management or leadership. This was a lightning talk. We're slowing that bad boy down for tonight. Um, I did also realize I could have made it even more lightning talk and just Bogart Eli's talk and say, well, managing humans is just dependency hell. Um, <laughs> but we can have some fun with this. So let's see how this evening goes. Uh, management is being responsible, accountable for people who report to you and you determine if they meet expectations that allow they, aha, them to be employed where you work as a manager. So this is not a tech lead, okay? Or one of these types of positions where it's like you're in charge of getting the project done, but you're not actually sitting down and saying this person's hired or fired. So I'm specifically talking about it when you have that management title. Some places they call it leadership, sometimes they call it management, but that's the definition of what we're talking about as a person here and why you don't want to switch into it. So you never switch, you never drift, you never graduate, get hired into, be promoted to managing people. This is that. Always treat it like changing careers. And get dedicated training in your new career. And only if you like the management structure and leadership styles where you work. The last fucking thing, I curse, okay? So if that's gonna be a problem, find other management. Um, so if you, this is like this huge critical thing. If you do not like how you're being managed, do not learn how to fucking manage from that person. <laughs> like it really just fucks shit up <laughs> for, for you long term. It, it, it's just really an unpleasant thing. I've known people who have done it. It is, that is a special form of miserable. And, and people have done it, right? Because they're like, oh, the company needs me to do it and things like that. So I, I don't want to like castigate those people that have, have done that. Um, okay, so do it though if you're okay with figuring out your relationship with power, how you want to yield it and how you want it yielded on you, right? Because until you're at the top and even at the top, you're gonna get squeezed in both directions when it comes to power. And this is going to be like the first thing that I talk about with someone when they're like, I'm going to become a manager. We get to have this really fun conversation around power. Books like the 48 Laws of Power, Managing with Power, all these types of interesting things, because that's what hierarchy sort of ultimately is, is power structures. So that's one thing that you're going to have to figure out how to get comfortable with. And you're okay with being isolated by your position of power. So the higher you are in a hierarchy, the more isolated you are. So get comfortable with that notion, right? You don't really, peers is an awkward and interesting thing when it comes to management because often you're competing for the same resources. Um, you're not okay. You're not into micromanaging. This is like a huge thing and it's incredibly fucking hard to define though, right? Like micromanaging someone is really actually surprisingly challenging to not do. It can be very easy to just micromanage someone. And there's just, there's just like a lot of art in figuring this one out with people about when they're asking for help, am I giving the right level of help? Am I giving too much help, not enough help? Shit, if I don't give them help, I'm gonna get blamed because we don't deliver this, blah, blah, blah. Like micromanaging winds up being a, a more challenging thing that you can see. It absolutely sucks to be on it. I've been micromanaged, it sucks. But it's hard not to do it. Um, and you're okay with not leading by only being technical, okay? Like this is like this thing that engineers will drift into where they'll just be like, hey, I can lead by doing all the architecture. I can lead by coding the proof of concepts and getting them out the door. I can lead by coding every day. Okay, here's what's wrong with this. A, your people aren't learning the skills that they need to be learning under you so that they can scale up and grow and have careers. And B, when I go to you and say, huh, I'm giving you a second team. Oh shit, your team can't actually deliver the work. So fast forward six months, I'm firing you because you never taught your team how to be functional. So it's a dangerous thing to do is to only lead by doing the technical parts of things and not actually figuring out how to enable your team and do all those managey sounding things. You can do the technical part. You can provide advice, guidance, those things, but I highly recommend not being the leads of these. You gotta be okay with firing people. Uh, this is the basic sort of reality of this shit. 
you may not be the one actually pulling them in the meeting to fire them, but I'll guarantee you at some point or another, you're putting the checkbox next to someone's name who's getting fired. And worst case, you're the one firing them. And like, the shit sucks. Like, I'll just be straight up and simple about it. Um, and it's really hard to fire people in an effective way because of how litigious our country is. So if every time you thought someone being fired, firing you was an asshole, one thing to check on and to think about is that person may have been listed off an entire list of shit they can never do or they lose their job by HR and legal. So it's a weird ass world of firing people and it just sucks. Um, and you're okay with determining if, you're be, if you are being manipulated when being asked for something. And then the really fucking fun part of this is, do you, you have to then decide whether or not you support the ask even if you're being manipulated, right? Because the ask on its own could be totally fucking legitimate, but it's done in a manipulative way. And so now you have to figure out how to handle saying yes to something that is right, but then be like, but you fucking trying to manipulate me. Like, it's just weird, awkward shit like this that you get to deal with. Um, now, here's the other fun thing. You need to be okay with knowing your leadership style and how you learn to manage will dictate where you can and can't be employed, and there are no standards for leadership styles. So you can sit down and say, oh, I'm a React developer, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a skill set that's up against it. When it comes to actually managing people, it's like freaking grayness. And it's in both directions, right? You're looking to find a place where you're compatible, and they're looking to, for people that are compatible with you. And honestly, where I have most of the hard challenge with it is in with me finding a place where I'm compatible to go in with, right? Like, it's really hard for places to represent their management and leadership styles because it's such a shit show, especially in tech, right? Because so many people just drift and switch into leadership, and they figure it out on the fly. I don't know. And, I guess I've worked in non-software worlds and it's shit there too. Um, <laughs> this gets even more specific the higher in management you get, right? So manager of software engineering teams, you get laid off, you need to find a new job, three months, four months. I don't know quite where the market is right now because we're in a contraction time. Director six months to eight months to find a new job, VP plus, you're at a year, two years to find a job, CTO, two to four years, is even easy times to be not working while you're trying to find something, if you care about where you manage. Uh, those are sort of some of the aspects you have to be comfortable with there. Um, yeah, being promoted as a manager means you're accountable for more, but you have less things you control but you control them with more certainty. So what it basically means is the higher you get up in the hierarchy, you'll have less things that you, that you can control, but you can control them with more certainty, which makes it look crueler, makes it look like you're not competent, makes it look like, oh, why didn't he like, tell us to do this part of it? Well, it's because that's not the domain I control. I only control this little domain. So it, it, it's a really weird concentrating of things as you go higher in the hierarchy. Um, <coughs> this is another huge things, which is every promotion means less problems which more people could not solve, <laughs> right? So the higher in the hierarchy, the, that whole group of people couldn't solve the problem that they're coming to you to help with. It's one of the fun parts of it if you like that. If you do not like this, it's a fucking nightmare. All right. And you're okay with promotion to management, managing leads of leads, right? So this is when you're no longer managing just an individual contributor. You're now managing a manager, right? It's almost like starting a new career again, to be honest with you. It's not the same as managing individual contributors. There's a lot of complexities that really start to show up in this. It's also your first real introduction into strategy if you're in a functional lead of lead role. You can be in a dysfunctional lead of lead role where you get no strategy setting and that sucks. That's pure management bullshit. Um, and so what it means is lol is no longer funny. Um, okay, with, and so this is within this context of being a lead of lead 
sort of manager here, you need to be comfortable with your two main sources of confidence, confidence being the psychic you hired and the Ouija board you stole from your kid. <laughs> and I want to explain why on this, okay? When the higher you get, the more strategy you're setting, the more you're looking out into the future to see how things are going to work, the less signal you're going to have on whether or not things are working underneath you. Hence, you need a psychic to help you see into the future to see how things are going to go. <laughs> All right? And like, you need to be confident in that. The Ouija board you stole from your kid is because, guess what? You always inherit the past of every manager before you, <laughs> right? But no one's going to tell you all the dirty secrets when you go to take over. So you're sitting there with the Ouija board of, I saw on the Git commit this guy, Sam, in 2019, committed this. What did it do? Like, like you're just fucking guessing. Like, what did he think? Like, you know, it just, it just sucks. Like you're, but you own that now. Right? Like, you're the lead of it. There's no saying, oh, well, I, I couldn't. No, like, your job is to get the shit done. Um, okay. Aging out as your technical skills deteriorate the higher you get, so you're trapped in leadership. This is a huge component that starts to take place with this, right? Like, the higher you get up, you should be upping your skills in strategy, people leadership, conflict resolution, all these other things. It means less and less time to keep your technical chops up. Unless you can take the pay cut. And you can survive the serotonin drop of being lower in the hierarchy. And this is a real fucking thing. Taking that step down hurts. Our brains are wired such that we produce more serotonin the higher we are in a hierarchy. It's what helps protect you from the human condition that you're going to be exposed to more. And so when you go down in a hierarchy, it literally hurts you from a chemical level. But you can do it. I've done it twice. It's OK. It's worth it because managing can really fucking suck. Um, and you're okay with managing people who make more money than you. Um, this is actually a pretty common element where you're managing people that actually have a bigger salary than you do. Um, here's the other part that I sort of alluded to before. The larger your organization, the more the human condition you're exposed to and how hard it is for people to be human becomes your problem. And so what happens is 50 people under you, Ah, you're dealing with an illness once a month, something along those lines, blah, blah, blah. A couple thousand people under you, you're dealing with deaths of family members every couple months, things along those lines. You get to a 10,000, 50,000 org, you're dealing with one or two deaths of people who work in your organization a year. And so you have to be able to handle the emotional toll of being exposed to the human condition through the lens of leadership. All the notions these days of bring your whole self to work, Psychological safety and all those things getting misconstrued, fucked around with. There's a lot of toxic psychological safety, in my opinion. It makes it so that you're exposed to even more of the human condition as a leader. And you have to find comfort with this shit. You have to find comfort with fucked up HR policies, where you're fighting for someone who was on a disability leave because they had a mental breakdown. And you're trying to fight for them to be able to have a job when they come back. Then they come back, and your HR department says, Oh, you have to rank them as if they were a full-time employment because they were out, they weren't out two days longer. So you get exposed to the human condition and the rule sets that fuck around with it and go along with it. Um, and then the big ending part here, you're not okay with being an asshat and a lack of self-awareness. The one big thing to sort of say here that's constantly as play is at each level that you come up and you move up in, you're incrementally increasing your self-awareness, right? Because at each level as you're coming up with these things, you're getting more and more comfortable with the unknown. You're getting more and more confident with just your situation and your own self-grounding because there's just so little to lean upon. Um, so if any questions you want to debate, just get my attention. Uh, you can find me on there. Uh, you can also pay me to help your company in these domains too, if you want, or just we can also just bullshit about it. You don't have to really, yeah, whatever. So that's that. Yeah. Yeah, but, but they grow up. Yeah. The kids. You don't have to fire them either. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't What's that? No, I've been off for three years.
So before, before, I was take, before I took this cycle of time off, I was a director of engineering at Capital One. What did you like about it? Sure, so what I like about it is teaching people how to do it, what I call quote unquote well, or where people go into it full, eye, full eyes open, right? So I had lots of different managers under me, so helping them get in it. We could actually really shift the business and improve things when we did things well in partnership with different parts of the company and other groups. And then for me personally, I really have been nerding out a lot on decision science, decision quality, and you really get to see how decisions play out and roll out in leadership more than you can necessarily as an individual contributor. And then just strategy. I mean, you get you, doing strategy and looking at things over rather long time horizons can be very engaging. So I would say those were some of the main things that I liked about it. I don't know. <laughs> no, I was not. Um, but I had people that coded stuff that were in the commercials. So. <laughs> So I used to, before I did software engineering, I run a landscaping team. So yeah, I actually had people roll in with guns after we fired them. <laughs> so that's the more extreme version of it. Firing blue collar is a hell of a lot easier because you're giving them like a nice severance package and they want a reference and stuff like that. But we've had people get violent. Um, I mean, the biggest fear that I've run into with, with firing in sort of these places is suicide. So that's usually where a lot of my concern is, is in making sure that we have the controlled environment for people getting home and making sure that they have paths to, you know, if they have a company phone, okay, do you have a personal phone that you can use to reach out? Okay, do you want, like, trying to get those types of things, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge making the environment safe for the people that are working there and then safe for the person that's no longer working there. The reason you're firing people may be because of, um, you know. Instabilities, right? yeah. Yeah, and it's tough. And the person that you hire one day can wind up becoming stable, unstable later on. So it's not even like an, an interviewing problem or, or question. It's just human nature. Yeah, it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, and it's, it's very hard because of the matrix of safety that you're trying to, to keep balanced. Why is it treated fairly trivially? Like, oh, just become a manager. So, so I think it's, it's a more of a modern phenomenon, in my, at least in software engineering. So I also spent a couple of years in pharmaceutical plant chemical engineering before I went into the software, as, as my transgression. Into, so in that ecosystem, I got to see where your quote unquote managers were professionally trained. And they took heavy courses, aspects along those lines. And it was, it was a very heavy investment in people. And now tech did start that way, I feel like. Like my first entry into it in 99 and 2000, I felt like that was more of a thing. People would take that on more. But then when the VC startup ecosystem really started to take off, it's like higher within is so much better be because they have the institutional knowledge, right? And like trying to like swap that component out with someone from the outside is a risk factor. And now it's gotten to this point where it's like, what, the average tenure is like two years for people? So it's just like constant freaking churn rate. And that same aspect happens. Like, so like the whole investment cycle in people seems to be broken up. And the investment cycle in a manager is pretty long compared to like investing in someone to upskill in like a specific tech domain or something like that. Like the, I'd say usually in the, in the better environments that I've been in, where someone's come to me and said, I'm up for being a manager and we think that's the right next step, I'd want to say it's about two to three months of just prep of going over things like relationship with power, all those elements before they make the decision, right? And that's after they've done tech lead work, things like that. So it's a, it's a heavier investment to do it well. And I think by large, the tech industry looks at the unicorns and companies like that and they have a very different motivation method for leadership than I think a lot of your more like companies that are grown 
by their own natural growth rates, not by hyper investment, hyper growth components. So those are some of my thoughts on it. Yeah? Sure, absolutely, and then I'm incredibly careful about how I talk with them about it, um, especially when it's someone who they feel like they, that's the path that they have to go to get recognized and to get what they want out of a career path in a, in a company. It's why, as a leader, I almost always look for organizations to be a part of that have a strong individual contributor path that can go up to like a VP level or things along those lines, but yeah, no, it's... It's a tricky thing watching that because people look at it and they're like, oh, more money aspects along those lines. And I, as I said before, I think it's a career shift. But have you said, had individuals who said, I'd like to think about this? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah. No, but I, as I sort of said, like, I've just, I've framed it very carefully so that I felt like they were going into it eyes wide open with what the pluses and minus. And what I'm really looking for is to hear what they feel the plus and minus is for them, is ultimately what I'm looking for. I'm really, I mean, my clean conscience is a minor component in the game of it. You had a question? What's your opinion on work-life balance as a manager? Uh, work-life balance as a manager? Um, so, I think it, 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 gets a, it gets abused, the notion of what should be or shouldn't be work-life management. And I think it's, it's an interesting element, right? Like, like an interesting component could be, and I've had this happen a number of times, I've had people work for me who would never take vacations out of personal choice. I had a, a role in one company where I would be penalized as a manager if they didn't take vacation. But they came to me and they said, my home life is so fucked up, I won't ever take a vacation. Right? So sometimes it's just personal choice for people. And that's where they're at. Some people, it's like, hey, I'm in a life cycle in my life right now. I'm single. I don't have kids. I plan on doing that. This is my time to crunch and to learn as much as I can. I want to be working 60, 80 hours a week. How you play with that with a team is an interesting beast. Then as it comes to demanding things of teams when there's like a cycle where you have to do stuff to make a day line and stuff along those lines, my ultimate goal is making sure that they understand why it's important to the company can we actually find a way to like tie it back to the, their compensation and then also figure out how to structure things so that they're able to come out and not wind up in a burnout situation? But the, it isn't the simple answer of like, oh, there is work-life balance, it's perfect. Oh, it's a, bullshit. It's not. It fluxes and it moves. The company will move in what it demands of people because of market changes and things along those lines. We're just security, right? I was at a company, we had a breach guess what you weren't doing? You weren't taking a shit ton of time off until that breach was fixed and resolved. Like, so there's cycles to these things, and I guess that's how I really look at it. I really look at the balance as being cycles. The people have their own cycles that they're looking for, and the company has its own cycles. A lot of, I'll be honest though, just a lot of leaders and stuff like that, they're type A, go, 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 so it can be hard for them to know how to shut things off and not demand more of others. But that'd be my rough opinion on it. Anything else? Talk life balance, go. Uh, I guess it's something along the lines of, um, uh, it's an open question maybe where you were questioning why technical people end up getting worked up in the management and working away from the management. Um, I feel like in technology, us as developers or us as technical people or whatever, we tend to learn more things, we tend to constantly be growing. Yes. Yes. We became an SP. As yep. We and um, that people see that. People recognize that we're constantly growing. Whereas I think a lot of other positions, uh, when you put your time in, you're due for a promotion. There's a big difference yeah. there in whether uh, working your way up is um, simply acquired or earned. Correct. And then there's a third component that you would be missing if, unless you were in a regulated environment, which is that you're promoted because you're dangerous as an individual contributor. Because and no you don't want the legal responsibility of firing them. And, you know, so like, so there is promotion due to incompetence. It is a real fucking thing. And it's most heavily in regulated environments. 
where you can wind up opening up legal liability if you fire someone. So if you thought that theory, it's real. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I helped answer some of the, what you were thought. Yeah, and you gave you give me, yeah, yeah okay. You're good? I'm done. I, they keep asking questions. I, <laughs> I'm not here as like a manager, like, yeah. I demand you ask me questions. No, we're done with that. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs>